Hi everyone, my name is Jack and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The Rachel O'Reilly case, one of Ireland's most violent crimes. When a person disappears without a trace or dies in mysterious circumstances, usually the other half is among the main suspects. Unfortunately, in about 80% of cases, suspicions are justified. In such crimes, there is usually not even a clear motive, and the crime itself has been defined as domestic, as if it were something ordinary. In the early 2000s, the high-profile case of Rachel O'Reilly literally shocked the whole of Ireland with its unprecedented cruelty and cold-bloodedness. A young woman and mother of two young children was brutally murdered in her own home, and police officers who arrived on the scene admitted that they had never in their practice encountered such a horrific crime scene. To solve this mystery and put all the pieces of the puzzle together, it took investigators several years of painstaking work. All this time the criminal remained at large and was sure that his guilt no one and never prove. Perhaps it would have happened, but the killer was let down by his own vanity. Well, let's take the whole story from the beginning. Who was Rachel O'Reilly? Rachel O'Reilly, maiden name Callally, was born in 1974 on the northern outskirts of County Dublin, Ireland. His biological parents' girl did not know. At an early age, she was adopted by spouses Rose and Jim Kalali, and she was brought up with four other adopted children of the couple. Their own heirs, Rose and Jim, could not have, so all their parental love without a trace gave foster children. From a small age, Rachel was an active and purposeful child. She studied well in school, played sports, helped her parents in the household, and never caused any problems. The girl grew up sociable, open, and incredibly kind. She easily got along with everyone and avoided any conflicts. As a teenager, Rachel was seriously engaged in softball, constantly took part in various competitions, and even set several local records. She also had a very strong bond with her foster mother, to whom she confided all her secrets and with whom she communicated constantly, even after she married and had children of her own. After graduating from high school, the girl enrolled in one of the local universities, deciding to get a degree in marketing. At the same time, she got a job as a salesperson in a city department store, and in her spare time, she continued to play sports, playing for the local team. Who is Joe O'Reilly? In fact, there is not much information about Joe O'Reilly's early life in public sources. He was famous for his inhumanity and extreme cruelty to his own spouse and the mother of his two children. But what kind of person he was as a young man is hardly ever talked about or remembered. It is known that Joe is also a native of County Dublin, where he was born in 1972 in a simple family. He was the second common child of his parents and was raised with his older sister. The children of the O'Reilly couple were not spoiled, and parents taught them that in life, everything should be achieved independently by their own efforts and hard work. The boy was quite tall, athletic, and was also fond of softball. After graduating from high school, he decided to study advertising by correspondence, and to earn a living, he got a job as a manager in a department store, the same department store where Rachel came a few months later. At the time of their first meeting, Joe was 19 years old, and Rachel was barely 17. The young man immediately noticed the new employee and took the initiative to be the first to meet her. Miniature smiling blonde blonde literally dizzy the guy's head, but only to go on a date with him, she for some reason categorically refused. Joe began to woo Rachel, said compliments, made little surprises in the form of flowers or chocolates at her workplace at the beginning of the day, but Rachel still remained cold to him. Desperate attempts to get the attention of the young saleswoman, with interest, watched almost the entire staff of the department store, and it even became a reason for jokes. However, Joe did not give up. He read Rachel's favorite book, so that they have a common topic for conversation. But it was only when Joe found out that Rachel was a serious softball player that things got off the ground. That's when he joined her at the stadium and walked onto the field during practice and joined the game. Since O'Reilly was long and familiar with softball, he showed all his skills and led the team to victory. This time, the young man managed to impress Rachel, and she finally agreed to go on a date with him. Their relationship developed rapidly, 
and Joe by all means and available ways to show that he is ready for the beloved to literally roll mountains. He unexpectedly organized for his beloved a trip to the most romantic city in the world, Paris, and there on top of the Eiffel Tower, he asked for her hand in marriage. Of course, Rachel could not resist and answered him in agreement. Then the naive girl thought that she met a real prince from a magical fairy tale with whom she will live a long and happy life. A few years later, the couple married, and then, one after the other, they had two sons in common. The couple moved to the quiet and picturesque Scottish province of Naol, where they purchased their own spacious, cozy home. It was the perfect place to raise their children. After the birth of their eldest son, Rachel left her job and became a housewife, devoting herself to the care of her husband and child. And two years later, the couple had a second son. So the young mother was completely absorbed by the heirs, and the main gainer in the family was Joe, who got a job in an advertising agency as a specialist in outdoor advertising. Those who were personally acquainted with the head of the family described him as a confident, purposeful, and not devoid of charming man. At work, he proved himself as a responsible, qualified specialist, punctual, and attentive. He was the first to arrive at the office, and always stayed late if the situation required it. Joe also continued to be active in sports, often stopping by the gym before the workday began, and in his and his wife's house, there were several exercise machines and a set of dumbbells. Over time, when the boys grew up a little and began to attend kindergarten, Rachel, in order to have their own additional income, became a distributor for one of the popular cosmetics companies and also sold household goods. Such work allowed her to communicate more with neighbors who spoke of her as a wonderful mother, a kind and open person. As time went on, Joe became less and less likely to come home. In fact, he came only to sleep, shower, and change his clothes. This behavior he wrote off the total employment at work and the upcoming promotion, which he was so looking forward to. His wife supported him as best she could, but gradually they began to drift apart, and family relations deteriorated markedly. In the summer of 2004, there was one extremely unpleasant event. An anonymous person sent a letter to Child Protective Services, which stated that Rachel is a bad mother and mistreats her sons, who at that time were four and two years old. In this regard, a special commission visited the couple's home and responded to the disturbing report. Although nothing suspicious was found, and all relatives and neighbors described Mrs. O'Reilly as a loving and caring mother, the letter cast a shadow on her reputation. What happened to Rachel O'Reilly? The morning of Monday, October 4th, 2004, began as usual. The head of the family left the house at dawn, while his wife and sons were still asleep, and went to work. Throughout the day, he texted and called his wife several times, but there was no answer. Then he called his home phone, but the answering machine went off, and Joe said in a shaky voice that he was very worried and asked his wife to call him back as soon as possible. In the afternoon, Joe received a call from the kindergarten teacher saying that Rachel had not come to pick up the boys, which had never happened before. Then Joe called his mother-in-law and asked if she knew where Rachel was, and when she said no, he asked Rose to go to their house and see if everything was all right. In the meantime, he went to the kindergarten to pick up the children. When Rose arrived at her daughter's home, she saw her car in the yard and realized that Rachel was home. However, the room itself was dark and quiet, and no one answered her call. The first thing that caught Rose's eye was the clutter, as if the house had been searched for something. Cabinets and drawers were open, their contents strewn on the floor. The whole thing looked like a robbery. The landlady was nowhere to be found, but when her mother entered the bedroom, a horrifying picture appeared before her eyes. Rachel was lying on the floor in a huge pool of her own blood. There was blood everywhere, on the walls, furniture, and even the ceiling. And through Rachel's bloody, tangled hair, in some places the bare bones of her skull could be seen. Rose rushed to her daughter, hoping she was still alive and could be helped. But when she touched her arm, she felt the limb was cold and stiff. Rachel had been dead for hours, and there was no way to help her. Unable to remember herself, Rose started screaming and calling for help, and then rushed to the phone to call the police. At her screams, the neighbors, among whom was a doctor, came running. He was the first to examine the body and confirmed that Rachel could not be helped. When Joe arrived at the house, 
there was already a crowd of people there. When he learned that his spouse was dead, he screamed and ran inside, saying he didn't believe it. In the bedroom, by his wife's body, he became hysterical. O'Reilly cried, screamed, and promised to kill whoever had done this to his beloved wife. According to police officers who arrived on the scene, they have never seen a more brutal picture of the massacre of a defenseless woman in their practice. Obviously, the weapon of the crime was some heavy blunt object, which Rachel was beaten with incredible ferocity. There's literally nothing left on her body. Apparently, the owner of the house was attacked from behind because she did not even try to resist or fight back. The overall picture really resembled a robbery, but professional instinct told the investigators that such a beating only with personal motives or acute dislike. But who would have a hand on a petite young woman and mother of two children? The first thing detectives did was to interview family members and neighbors of the deceased. All of them confidently stated that Rachel had no enemies or ill-wishers, and that she was on friendly terms with everyone. Neighbors on that day did not notice anything suspicious, no strange cars or any strangers near the victim's house. Joe stated that he had been at the bus depot on the other side of town most of the day, where he had gone for work and his alibi could be confirmed by a co-worker. The co-worker did confirm Joe's words, but the police were still haunted by vague doubts. Something was definitely wrong here. The situation looked like a robbery, but nothing of value had been taken, only scattered items. In the bedside table of the bedroom, almost in plain sight, lay a thousand euros, which remained untouched. Another stash was in a kitchen cupboard, but this too was untouched. There was also a jewelry box on the dressing table, but only a pair of chains and earrings were missing, lying separately in a drawer. In addition, according to the homeowner, a digital camera, silverware, and one of his dumbbells, which was probably the weapon of crime, were missing. It all seemed too strange. The house was turned upside down, the landlady brutally murdered, and all this over some little thing. Joe, answering police questions, was crying, shaking and feverish, but as one of the investigators later admitted, it seemed to him that such a state of the guy was not grief or shock at all, but rather like nervous excitement. O'Reilly behaved even more strangely when asked if his wife might have had an affair on the side. Joe changed his face and confidently stated that there was no such thing, and then added that he had not cheated on his wife, but this phrase sounded very unconvincing. Two miles from the scene of the crime, in the bushes, was found a bag with things missing from the house. Inside was a camera, silverware, and a couple of pieces of jewelry. All items were from the list of stolen items that Joe had compiled. Now the robbery theory could be dismissed completely, and the case could be reclassified as premeditated murder. Suspicious Widower In spite of all the widowed fellow's attempts to portray grief and pain, it looked fake, and he immediately became the main suspect. Joe had nothing to present yet, but the detectives had to check his alibi in detail to study the scene of the crime and learn about their relationship with his wife. Joe said that in the morning before work, he decided to stop by the gym, which he did regularly, and the surveillance cameras in the parking lot, as well as in the gym itself confirmed it. He then drove to the office and from there he went to a bus station in a remote part of the city in order to monitor the placement of advertisements on vehicles. His words were confirmed by a colleague with whom he allegedly called at the time. The investigators then went to Joe's workplace, where they seized his computer for inspection. This is where the most interesting part began, because the email contained strange correspondence, which Joe had partially deleted. Specialists were able to recover the deleted messages, and the police were finally convinced that they were going in the right direction. Most often, Joe corresponded with his friend and his own sister, and to both of them, he constantly complained about his wife. He wrote about Rachel using insults and profanity. He wrote that his wife had not attracted him as a woman for a long time, and in general, causes him outright disgust. Moreover, the computer found another curious correspondence between Joe and one of his colleagues, a woman named Nikki Pelly. From their communication, it was clear that these two were much closer than just friends, and they should both be questioned. Who's Nikki Pelly? Nikki also worked for an advertising company, and she and Joe had a lot of work-related interactions. The woman was 10 years older than Joe, 
but that didn't stop them from having an affair. When exactly began their workplace romance, it was not possible to establish, but it was at her Joe spent evenings and even nights, and his wife lied about the fact that too busy with work. But this was not the strangest thing in the discovered correspondence. It turned out that Joe had promised Nikki in his messages that they would soon be together. He, she, and their sons, referring to his children with Rachel. Such messages were more than suspicious because in the event of a divorce, the boys would be left to live with their mother. Joe, who initially claimed that he had no affairs on the side, realized that it was pointless to deny it because irrefutable evidence of his infidelity was found. Then he admitted that he had indeed been secretly dating Nikki for a while, but then they allegedly broke up. For more than a week, the O'Reilly house was cordoned off as a crime scene, and no one was allowed in because the police needed to scrutinize and document everything. During this time, Joe was staying with his sister and the boys were staying with their grandparents. At the funeral, Joe didn't look like a grieving widower. He acted remarkably calm, and most importantly, as if he was shunning the coffin with his late wife. When it was his turn to say goodbye, he did so quickly, coldly, and as he left, he indifferently said that the coffin could be closed and buried. When the family was allowed to return home, everything there looked as it had on the day of the crime, except for the body on the floor. Joe asked his father-in-law and mother-in-law to go with him, and they agreed, figuring he needed the support. On the spot, however, the son-in-law suddenly began to speculate about how the killer might have dealt with Rachel. He walked around the room in which his wife had been murdered and described how she had been attacked, the force with which she had been struck, pointing each time to dried blood spatters. Joe then suggested that the perpetrator might have gone to the bathroom to wash the blood off his hands and the crime weapon, which he then took with him. His account was horrifyingly detailed and full of detail, with Joe also waving his arms around to mimic the blows. However, his grief-stricken parents wrote off his behavior as an attempt to relieve stress and talk it out. Although Rose later admitted that all this time, she did not let go of the idea that the son-in-law repeats the actions committed by him earlier, and it was he who massacred their daughter. Thirst for Fame Almost immediately after the funeral, O'Reilly began to actively communicate with the press, giving interviews left and right. He willingly invited reporters to his home, literally arranging them tours of the scene of the crime, and described how everything happened. At the same time, Joe every time on camera addressed the criminal, offering him to voluntarily surrender to the police. Three weeks after the tragedy, the loved ones of the deceased agreed to participate in the shooting of a TV program devoted to this crime. But if Rachel's parents were depressed and literally killed by grief, then Joe on the set behaved as if he was a star. He vividly communicated with the makeup artists interested in how he will look like in the frame, and in the breaks eagerly nibbled on the proposed treats, drinking their coffee. The police, who were still looking at Joe, decided to follow him, and found that from the set he went straight to his mistress Nikki, who spent the night. By that time, the last doubts that he was the killer had already been dispelled, and it remained only to collect irrefutable evidence for the court. Gathering evidence was a very long, complicated, and painstaking process because the most important thing, the instrument of the crime, was not found. Nevertheless, there was enough other evidence. The first to speak were Nikki and the colleague who had confirmed Joe's alibi. They were both facing jail time for perjury, so they decided not to risk their freedom. Nikki admitted that she and Joe had not broken up at all, as they claimed earlier, but continued their relationship. Moreover, about their connection found out Rachel, because of which the spouses had a big scandal on the eve of the tragedy. The colleague, however, said that he was not sure whether Joe was at the time of his wife's murder at the bus station on the other side of the city. The guy simply confirmed his friend's words at his request, not knowing at the time that O'Reilly was a suspect in the crime. Recovered correspondence from Joe's computer, in which he insulted his wife and planned his future with his mistress and children, was also attached to the case. The police also examined numerous interviews with Joe and footage from the TV program and concluded that he described the crime in the kind of detail that only a criminal could know. In part, it was the widower's careless remarks that made it possible to reconstruct the full picture of the crime. 
In the morning, he really went to the gym, deliberately getting into the lenses of all the cameras there. Then he also warned his colleagues that he would be absent from the office because he would leave for work in another part of the city and his phone may not be available. Then he went not to the bus station, as he said, but to his home where he armed himself with a dumbbell and hid in the marital bedroom, waiting for his wife, who had left to take the children to kindergarten. He attacked her suddenly, from behind, leaving no chance of escape. After the massacre, Joe, as he himself admitted, washed off the blood from himself and the murder weapon in the bathroom adjacent to the bedroom. The perpetrator then changed his clothes, scattered his belongings around the house to simulate a robbery, and went to work. On the way, he threw the items away and disposed of the soiled clothes and dumbbells so that they would not be found. He also thoughtfully called his already murdered wife's cell phone several times, sent her a couple of messages and recorded voicemails on the answering machine, asking her to call him back. In the office, he was acting strangely and looked overexcited, and his hands were shaking slightly. Some of his colleagues noticed this and asked if he was all right, but Joe was confused and instead of answering, he hurried to his office, where he soon received a call from the daycare center, informing him that the boys had not been picked up. He did not hurry to go home, but instead sent his mother-in-law to be the first to find his daughter's disfigured body. He thought he had thought of everything, and that his guilt would be impossible to prove, but his thirst for fame and public attention played against him. Joe was not taken into custody until two years after his crime. Despite the fact that most of the evidence was circumstantial, Joe's guilt was proved by reconstructing the entire route of his movements that day on the signal of a cell phone, with which he did not part. It is noteworthy that at the time of Rachel's murder, Joe's cell phone signal came from the family home. It was verified later with the help of billing. In addition, it was revealed at trial that the anonymous letter to Child Protective Services was written by Joe's mother at the request of her son. Joe knew that he would not have sole custody of the boys in the event of a divorce, so he tried to smear his wife by making her look like a bad and abusive mother. But social services officials found no corroboration for what the anonymous message said, so O'Reilly decided to act, for sure. He felt no remorse, he smiled in the courtroom, talked animatedly with his defense attorneys, and even tried to joke, believing that he would be released anyway. But in the summer of 2007, the court found Joe guilty and sentenced him to life imprisonment. The lawyers tried to challenge this decision, but all their complaints and appeals were rejected. It is noteworthy that the relationship between Joe and Nikki continued even after the guy went to prison. His mistress visited him regularly for many years, but in 2022, for unknown reasons, they stopped communicating. Joe O'Reilly never pleaded guilty. In prison, he has become a model inmate who never causes any trouble, hoping to achieve parole eligibility one day. Thanks for watching guys, Jack was with you. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.